the great thing around the COP is that, or any COPs, is that you start to see solutions and that you go uh, to a number of the pavilions where you start to see where successes are happening. And then those successes are taken back by stakeholders or by governments or intergovernmental organizations to accelerate change. And that's, I think, really important. And then you have emerging issues that are coming up, like blue carbon or, or whatever, uh, they're doing in the water constituency or in the health constituency. And those are helping also in the uh, outside space to kind of have air to develop. Now, if they mature, like the ocean discussion, they will find their way in ultimately mm. to the negotiations. But to begin with, you want those that are already want to move that, like the methane pledge, to go ahead and actually prepare the ground so that when it comes into the negotiations, it's a lot easier to get uh, commitments. And to some extent, you know, if you've already delivered on some of the commitments, the issue then is how do you help the countries that have a, yet to be able to have the capacity to, 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 to join that conversation? And around the methane pledge, there is a secondary um, organization that helps with capacity building, with uh, funding and with tech transfer. So you're seeing the emergence of these coalitions of the willing, but then the emergence of mechanisms to help those to deliver and I think that's a very exciting space. Welcome to Inside Ideas with me, Mark Buckley. We will be speaking to regenerative futurists, game changers, on systemic change and about desirable futures with those who want to see us on the right side of history. Brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Felix Dodds and Chris Spence are my guests on this episode of Inside Ideas. Brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. We're here today to discuss heroes of environmental diplomacy. I've got it right here from Erskine and Rutledge, a fabulous book. Um, we're going we're gonna to dive deep in, into it. Uh, Felix and Chris both are the editors of this book and brought together some stories and tales, real life uh, experiences from people on the ground experiencing this and Although they probably didn't know it at the time that they were heroes, it has emerged that they've done some horrific feats. Uh, Felix uh, has been a leading thinker in the area of global governance for 30 years now. A vice president multi of multilateral affairs, Rob and Mil Milani Walton Sustainable Solutions Services at Arizona State University and an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina. Previously, he was an advisor to the Food Foundation and their grantees for the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. He was the co-founder of the Communitas Coalition for Supporting SDG 11 on Sustainable Cities and Communities from 1992 to 2012. He was an executive director of Stakeholder Forum, and during that time, he has chaired the first UN conference to come out with a set of indicative SDGs in September 2011. He has edited and written tons of books, 24, and three of them have now officially been on the podcast. He's been here before, and I'm so glad to have him back. Um, Chris, Chris Spence is uh, also here, as you can see, my lovely guest. Uh, Chris is a hero of environmental diplomacy, uh, profiles in courage. He's also a writer, an environmentalist, has worked internationally on sustainable development, conservation, climate change, health policy, and he has held leadership positions at nonprofit organizations in New York, New Zealand, and California. He also consulted widely for the United Nations, IUCN, World Con Conservation Union, 
for the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, and he has undertaken assignments in more than 40 countries on five continents focused in particular on climate change and sustainable development policy and practice, as well as international law. He's also served as a political advisor and journalist and been on the boards of several environmental organizations. He is also an award-winning writer. Chris is the author and co-author of several books, including Global Warming, Personal Solutions for a Healthy Planet. Um, Paul Grave Macmillan uh, in 2005 as the publisher. Rock Happy in 2021, he holds an MA and a BA degrees in political science history from Victoria University. And he's the singer and part of a kick-ass band, TDK, the the band out of the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, and they play exactly the type of music I like. Welcome, both of you superstars to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great to be it's here. It's so good to have you here. And if anybody knows the uh, amount of anything within sustainability, especially in the spaces of the United Nations, those um, accolades that I just gave you with your introduction are actually pretty damn short because they go on and on. If you get into the space of, of diplomacy, negotiations into the UN space, not only is it as a maze of governance and international organizations and acronyms and abbreviations and this commission and this committee and this chair and and that it just goes on and on. It is, uh, you have to almost be a hero just to make your maze through that uh, uh, web of, of climate, environment, human rights issues that, that are dealt in. And, and that we're just talking, you know, the United Nations, but that's, that's a big beast in and of itself. So I uh, appreciate you bringing and surmising um, some of, yeah. <laughs> Because th th this is this is is the book here, and uh, it shouldn't scare anybody. Because most of the material that comes out uh, that talks about climate, UN, IPC reports, when you see them, you're, they're usually in biblical proportions, and you're like, "Oh, I'm going to have a heart attack." I, I I don't even read my kids' uh, bedtime story, let alone these these big works. And you guys have nicely edited and brought together some beautiful stories on on how things have developed. And so, uh, first of all, I wanted to, to really thank you for that and, and, and as we get in into our discussion today. Right at the beginning, the book dedication uh, is to those who, who, you, who you talk about in the book um, who have taken part in these intergovernmental negotiations, those who have been trying to secure fair and equitable and sustainable worlds for all of us to live in. And uh, it's a thank you to them. And having been at many climate conferences, I, 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 it, it's a big task to, to get into this space. So uh, you've done, you've done a, jo a wonderful job in the beginning. Um, I want to start out with the first question with Felix. And really, Felix, it's good to see you again. We saw each other at COP27 in, in Egypt and Shaman Sheikh. Um, and so I want to catch up with both of you first. How are you? How have you weathered it? And how, how, how did you leave that, that, uh, that climate conference? Are, are you okay? You, did you survive? Are you going to make it to the next one? Well, uh, well, for a start, uh, Chris has written a bedtime story for children, and so he can tell you a bit about that uh, when you go to him. And it's a really good book as well, the first of many. Um, I went away from Egypt before the final negotiations had been completed, and I was following the agriculture negotiations, which were one of the last ones. Uh, I mean, it was, in a sense, an intermediary cop. And so... Um, that we got an agreement on loss and damage was a real surprise to me. I had not expected that to happen. And so I think the um, Pakistan presidency of G77 and the presidency of um, the COP, the Egyptians, deserve a lot of credit for getting that through. How, how it will develop in 
the next year and become operational. We'll have to see, but I think that was a really important um, development. So I, I think the the event, um, the COP was a, was a success. Uh, I don't think there's more we could have got out of that COP than we did. So I feel pretty happy about it. And I think there are a whole lots of interesting things that have already started to happen. So there is already a transitionary committee for uh, for the loss and damage. Uh, it'll meet in Luxor in a week's time, I think. Uh, so, you know, people are still carrying on working. They're not waiting for the next COP. Why, and, and th I believe this is because you're a heck of a diplomat and have, have this uh, great sense of, of diplomacy or, or political correctness about you. Why, when I hear you talk about it, it sounds like you're cheering about loss and damage. I think it's about uh, uh, a lower bar as we could have set. And I was just wondering, what, why cheer about it? Why, are, why should we be excited about something that's actually coming up short? Well, for a start, the, uh, I, my prediction was that we wouldn't get we wouldn't get any agreement on loss and damage. Um, and I actually remember saying this to the chief Pakistan negotiator, Farooq Khan, uh, and then he, they managed to get an agreement. So the, there is an agreement. We'll have to see what happens, but that is a huge difference than what I expected to come out. Now, if you're asking me what needs to happen. Do we just wait for that loss and damage fund to come into existence, which doesn't accept historical responsibility? Then I'd say no. I was literally in Barbados this last week talking uh, with some with the Caribbean Development Bank about trying to advance um, some funds now or soon to enable support for vulnerable groups because the loss and damage fund won't come to medium-sized countries like Barbados. It'll go to least developed countries or um, uh, least, least developed countries and it'll go pretty much, I think, for infrastructure. So the question is, how do we use the result to get additional funds to go to vulnerable groups like children or women or people with disability or indigenous peoples, or in this case, the one I'm looking at is small scale farmers and fisher people. Thank you. I, I really appreciate those insights. Chris, were you also uh, at COP and, and how is to your extent your, your participation in all, all these, uh, right after COP, there was uh, COP 27, there was COP 15 in Montreal. Um, next week or in a couple of days, we'll have the uh, uh, water conference in, in New York. Um, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys there. Um, so I'll be there as well. But I just kind of want to know where are you at and how are you feeling where we're going now moving forward? What's how, how have you weathered the storm and what what's your your stance where you're at now? Yeah, that's a That's a great question. So I was I, uh, like you guys. I was at uh, COP27 um, there with uh, I was, so I was representing the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, uh, which is a, a specialist kind of reporting service that kind of looks at what's happening and tries to explain it in a very balanced and even way um, and analyzes what's going on it's a great it's a it's a great resource for those who really want to get to grips with what's happening in these negotiations so if you're interested check out EMB Earth Negotiations Bulletin and you'll find out more but I came away feeling a little bit like like Felix that there was we got out of it more than I expected now granted my expectations were quite, <laughs> were quite low I didn't I did not expect the loss and damage fund and that's that's a good thing um, you know, sadly, there wasn't progress on, you know, getting that big, scary number down, like keeping us within the 1.5 degrees. We did not make the progress that we needed to do at COP27. But, you know, as Felix mentioned, that was, you know, he, he referred to COP27 as being a kind of intermediary, or intermediary COP. And that's, that's it's, it's something that if you speak to climate insiders, they'll tell you that, these COPs are, are not necessarily designed to be one-off, we're going to change the world or save the world with one COP. You know, we're now at COP27. We've made significant progress, but it is incremental gains. And I think that, I think the key thing coming into to be aware of when you're looking at these UN meetings is that they're designed to be, they're designed as a marathon happening over multiple years rather than a sprint to, 
you know, suddenly save the world. They're not COP27, no single cop is uh, Superman or Superwoman you know, <laughs> sweeping in to save the day. And so, um, you know, they're not designed that way now. Now it would be great if they could be, but that's just, that's not how they're set up. Um, and so within the constraints of the UN system, I think it was a pretty decent COP, um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited for COP28. And then you mentioned the UN Water um, Summit, which is starting in a couple of days, which I'm also looking forward to, and I'm, I'll, I'll be there also. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what level of commitments countries make there, you know, and what they bring to the table, because it's it's another process where where governments really need to step up and and improve their game. So, yeah, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. But, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. Let, let me just come in there a couple of things. I, I think that um, on the, the COP itself, you know, what we saw was um, if we look at pr prior to Paris, we were on a four to six degree trajectory by the end of the mm -hmm. century. We're now on a 1.8 to 2.4 or 2.7. So, we're talking about a massive change in a relatively small period of time. And the global stock taking at COP28 will accelerate that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you can't do everything in COP. It just doesn't work because it's a consensus um, organization. And so what you see in these coalitions of the willing, like on methane, the methane pledge. So the countries that want to go ahead and move a particular issue forward, the finance, the Glasgow Finance Initiative, they're all having big impacts out there, but they're not actually in the negotiations. Some are about to join. So I think oceans, we've seen in two COPs now, a process that's moving oceans into a negotiation. So sometimes it takes a while to build the narrative that allows an issue to come in. Um, my problem with the water conference is there's no outcome document. So it, it's not a negotiating uh, forum. And so I'm actually not going to it. Uh, I think that there are interesting things that will happen. I think there's a pledge on uh, lead pipes that's being led by the Water Institute in um, uh, University of North Carolina. It's following a similar model to the methane pledge outside the system. So I think there will be some interesting initiatives, as Chris said, uh, but the, you know, unless those are then brought into policy recommendations, they, there's a problem with it. And I think the policy recommendations, if they're going to do it, will need leadership from certain countries taking it into the UN General Assembly's second committee in the autumn. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, I don't see that happening. So the first water conference, and I don't know, 40 years or 30 years, yeah, won't have yeah, an outcome. And I, think that, that is, and I think that's a shame. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, is, speaking about the water conference is, I saw a, a, a pre-water type of event that occurred, and Jane Fonda was there, and it was actually at, at uh, that we just had had come to an agreement on the oceans, and Jane yeah. Fonda posted a picture, and I actually thought that you were sitting in front of her, just down to the left, in her in her selfie, and I was like, "Hey, is, hey Felix, is that you, or is are you in the, the if, this, it, uh, pre if it had yeah, been if it if it had been in the Vienna Cafe that day, I probably would have been there. <laughs> I, it's well known I don't go into the negotiations. I usually stay in the coffee bar chatting with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you said. And so it was, it's really interesting. This uh, has been an intentional setup with these questions because I want my readers to know that uh, you guys aren't just academics that have sat somewhere and have never been to a climate conference, don't know how the negotiations work, don't know how the conferences go, um, that you are very steeped and also have uh, opinions and, and thoughts on how how this should function and where it's going and to make sense of it, which the most of us as lay, as lay people do not have, have, have that luxury. And so um, before the COP27 and afterwards, um, um, there was a lot of rumors. Boy, what a joke. Why are we still running around? Why are we still attending, attending the cops? Why are we still at these, uh, uh, um, these meetings? Why are they having that? It's not bringing anything. Uh, th things like that are running around. And then just last week, the Club of Rome submitted a letter to, uh, not Ban Ki-moon, to yep. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General, 
about the climate conferences and kind of asking for a reform. I want to ask, have either of you read that? Have you both read it? Mm -hmm. And could you just give me your insights on that? And, and also, what do, what do, how do we address that um, with, with those type of comments, with people <laughs> thinking that? And now also that larger organizations are actually printing, presenting letters saying, we're going too slow, it's not happening, can we get some change or reform in the system. Chris, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, I would say that, um, I would say that there's a lot of call to reform the cops because they're, there are these big beasts and they've gotten bigger every year. Like my first, so my first cop was cop four in 1998. And there was probably 2000, 3000 people there. And the latest one, cop 27, how many were there? 30,000? 30, 30, 35 to 40, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, it's turned into this massive beast. And I would say that of those 40,000 people, maybe one or 2000 are really involved in the negotiations, right? They're, they're, they're talking about these documents and the outcomes and decisions and what governments should do. So what are the other 38,000 people doing? And, and, it's a, and it's a really legitimate question. Um, now, I think personally that there's a lot of good things happening. There's a lot of people meeting, making co coalitions. You know, as Felix said, a lot of the stuff doesn't go on inside the negotiations anymore. And so I think there's a real benefit to getting those coalitions of the willing together um, and seeing what they can they can generate you know i do think that there's an argument that the negotiators are overloaded because what tends to happen with those two thousand people right dealing with negotiating documents is it's there's lots of different groups that are meeting now there's the conference of the parties to the original u.n climate convention there's the kyoto protocol that's still running along there's the paris agreement and under those they all have agenda items and then there's yeah. what's called subsidiary bodies so there's tons of different groups meeting and there's literally hundreds of agenda items that need to get discussed now there is an argument that and, and it's very hard to take away agenda items because if you say oh well we really do we really need to be talking about you know the adverse effects of response measures well someone will put their hand up and say well we put that down on the agenda and it's really important to us so it's very hard to remove agenda items. And now we've got hundreds of agenda items. So the complexity is incredible. And I do think that there's a strong argument to say, well, let's try and rationalize this. Let's try and, um, let's try and reduce what we're talking about so that we can get strong outcomes. Um, and, and I think that discussion should happen. The other thing I would say is that, you know, just to, just to touch on something Felix um, mentioned before, which is that, you know, this idea that cops do have an impact beyond the, you know, beyond their little, this little world. And I think a lot of your uh, listeners or readers might be thinking, well, wh why does, you know, how do these kind of arcane UN meetings, wh what impact do they have? The truth is that there are nearly 200 governments from around the world that come to these meetings that make decisions. Then they bring those decisions back to government. And then they have to enact those, those laws or change those policies. And that's one of the things, the points we make in the book. We have three chapters on climate change in our book. And you could ask, well, hang on, don't we still have, you know, if this is a book about success stories, don't we still have a bit of a climate change problem? <laughs> so, but this, this, but one of our points in the book is that these meet, you know, these big outcomes, like when you get a Kyoto Protocol or a Paris Agreement, they actually do have a significant impact that cascades all around the world through government policies. It influences business decisions. It influences investment in new technology, wind power, solar, whatever it might be, and that it has an outsized impact. And the big measure of that, which Felix mentioned before, but I think is worth reiterating, is that, you know, prior to 2015, when the Paris Agreement was signed, we were staring down the barrel of between four and six degrees Celsius of warming, not Fahrenheit, that's, my math is terrible, but it's something like 14 degrees Fahrenheit warming. Now we've reduced it to somewhere in the order of 2 to 2.5, something like that. So that's still terrible, right? But it's not catastrophic. And that all came through the UN, these UN agreements, in my view. So that's, that's the note of optimism that I think that I have when I look at the COPs. But, you know, to, to, to get back to your question about could they be simplified? You know, yeah, <laughs> I think they could. 
Just just to add to that, I mean, a couple of things. One is the, uh, uh, people perhaps forget, but the financial crisis of 2008 had a big impact on helping us to deliver this because there's a very good report by Nick Robbins uh, when he was at HSBC looking at how green were the recovery packages. And I think I think the U.S. 20, 20 to 30 percent of the recovery package was accelerating work on solar and other uh, new technologies. And so that helped move those things quickly. The second thing is that um, I echo what Chris says. I was in the agriculture negotiations. I would say there was no more than 50 stakeholders in the room over the, the negotiating time. Um, they were all doing other things. So there are different reasons to go to a COP. Yeah, if you're engaged in the negotiations, then that's one particular small group. It always has been. That doesn't matter what negotiation. It's a small group of people who are actually influencing the policy, often representing a very large constituency who've come to a position. It's not just them. It's a, it's a bigger group. Um, the second thing is that we, uh, the great thing around the COP is that, or any COPs, is that you start to see solutions and that you go uh, to a number of the pavilions where you start to see where successes are happening. And then those successes are taken back by stakeholders or by governments or intergovernmental organizations to accelerate change. And that's, I think, really important. And then you have emerging issues that are coming up, like blue carbon or, or whatever, uh, they're doing in the water constituency or in the health constituency. And those are helping also in the uh, outside space to kind of have air to develop. Now, if they mature like the water, dis uh, the ocean discussion, they will find their way in ultimately mm. to the negotiations. But to begin with, you want those that are already want to move that, like the methane pledge, to go ahead and actually prepare the ground so that when it comes into the negotiations, it's a lot easier to get uh, commitments. And to some extent, you know, if you've already delivered on some of the commitments, the issue then is how do you help the countries that have yet to be able to have the capacity to, 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 to join that conversation? And around the methane pledge, there is a secondary um, organization that helps with capacity building, with uh, funding and with tech transfer. So you're seeing the emergence of these coalitions of the willing, but then all emergences the emergence of mechanisms to help those to deliver. And I think that's a very exciting space. The Club of Rome report. There's no way that the Club of Rome report is going to be implemented. It's a great set of recommendations that need to be looked at. Some can be. The low-hanging fruit, I think, which I'm not absolutely sure yet which, because I haven't read it. I've read it, but I haven't kind of pulled out the low-hanging fruit, but I will do to have a look and see what you can do. It will be... Just the beast is too big. Uh, I mean, having, they've had a meeting, I think, the last couple of days with the Secretary General. But the problem with it is that it's not the Secretary General's responsibility. It's the member states of the convention. So the member states of the convention will have to make a decision that they want to set up a governance track to amend it. And the problems with that is everybody has to agree to those governance changes. And on the UNF, on the framework convention, if you touch that and you try and change it, then it will have to go to the US Senate, which means 67 votes to be able to amend the convention. And that's never going to happen. And so the question about what you do is you have to keep it like the Paris Agreement in a space that doesn't require it to get a um, in a sense, amended through parliaments. Because if you have to go down that track, then the Americans will never be able to help you on that. I love that you bring that up and kind of go into details and, and explaining it because that's also giving insights of, of how, how things happen and process there. A lot of people, specifically with the climate conference, um, tend to think that, you know, the UN is making all these, it's the member states, it's the country mm -hmm. delegations, uh, that are, are really doing things that the UNFCCC is just a framework for people to have a, a, a big event together and get in the same room and do the negotiations and have the structure and the guidelines and, and the place in order to, to do that. But the UN's hand is, hands are tied for uh, 
collecting monies for NDCs for all, all sorts of things when it comes to commitments that have been made or commitments that haven't been made to do a lot of those things. And so by you saying that as it's perfect because the structure uh, is really not set up where, yeah, you can go to the person at the top and then he's going to say, okay, this is the next thing. And so, but it, it takes a while for that, that understanding to sink in how, how that works. Um, I also do think though, on, on the side of the club of Rome, you know, it's the planetary emergency group that has submitted that Johan Rockstrom, Ban Ki-moon even signed it right. as well. Um, uh, they want they want to let people know it's it's time to 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 keep pace with our system keeps pace with the pace of our world or the pace of our problems that uh, you know there is emergency and something should be done and I think that voice the letters the um, can help nudge and and get things moving you know what we we hope. Um, could I could um, I just say just sure, say go ahead yeah I mean so. I, I think both Chris and I would welcome welcomes the Club of Rome letter. I think it's got some great stuff in. Um, the, I mean, Jochen Rockström, you know, is one of the great thinkers of our time. The work he did on the planetary boundaries were was enormous. But we haven't gotten planetary boundaries in the system. I mean, the reality of uh, of it is, though he's recognised those planetary boundaries, you know, we still are looking at these things in a piecemeal fashion. Future Earth was set up partly to bring the academic community into a, a focus around that, and it still hasn't managed to succeed in that. But these, uh, the thinking around the Club of Rome document is important. The, the, the issue then is, if you're going to move it in, you need to have very good lobbyists. Um, and at the moment, um, they have to kind of work out, which, I think they have to work out, but we all who are committed to a successful uh, UNFCCC have to look at which bits can actually be done easier and get some successors under the belt as opposed to try and do the whole thing, which I think would be the wrong approach because I don't think you can take the whole thing and push it in because it wasn't created here attitude from member states mm. will make it very, very difficult to happen. The other thing is that we address some of those politics in the three chapters, the one on the Kyoto Protocol, uh, the one on Paris and the one on um, Copenhagen. And, and Chris can talk to uh, those perhaps better than I can, but I think there are some really interesting lessons. Uh, one could argue one of them being uh, the Copenhagen one, where we could have had the Copenhagen Accord, which is basically the Paris Agreement in 2009, if the Americans hadn't mucked it up at the end. But maybe Chris wants to comment on that. I, I agree, and that's what I'm tickling to. I don't want to go there just yet, because I, 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 I am getting to the book. This is in the book, and, and there's, there's really, specifically in those three chapters, but there's in a couple other chapters, some really interesting things that come out as well, and I, I and I want to I want to bring those out. But I, you know, everybody at first they want to they want to ask the controversial, the hard topics. They want to uh, kind of understand and and that. But the, you, you're addressing those. You're actually talking about how how these people have emerged as heroes because they're they're actually did it in a system like this to kind of help move this slow, antiquated, or very complex process mm -hmm. forward. And, 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 and that's what I'm trying to get out. And the last bit of controversy is really and that I want to discuss and kind of see which you already mentioned and we, we tickled upon with um, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, how, uh, you know, he, even though he was presented with that letter, it's kind of, it's not up to him. That's not how the structure works. Well, the same thing, uh, We've got. We're going now into COP28, and two two things have happened. Al Gore had a, a outrageous type of a response to the new president of the COP because of his current position and experience with, with oil and gas, being the president of the COP um, in, in that structure. But also that there was some pretty strong words from Barbados and Antonio Guterres at the World Government Summit. I was also there about what we need to do, what the ambitions are, and about the fossil fuel industry. And then yet it, under the umbrella of the UN and the climate secretariat, the UNFCCC, now our president, um, 
will be that. And it, it raises a lot of red flags for people who can't see behind that. And, and, and especially when people like Al Gore are making those statements. So I kind of want to get thoughts and ideas and inputs on that, why it is that how can that happen in an, in an organization like that, that the people that we think or the, the fossil fuel industry, the ones that we're trying to make those changes, that all of a sudden now they're, they're there in the climate conferences and, and they're the president as well. Hmm. And maybe your thoughts and views on that and how that deals with the system and the structure that you address so well in the book. Hmm. Do you want to go first, Felix, or should I, should I have a go? It's up to you. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I can give a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, one is that the, you know, that one of the reasons um, why the United Arab Emirates is hosting the next COP is that the COPs rotate regionally. So each region, um, each UN region has its term. And so that there, were, there, there must have, I assume, have been an internal discussion among those members, member states, about who should take it on next time. Um, so, so that's 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 just the kind of mechanics of how it happened. Then, in terms of, you know, is this, you know, certainly, I mean, there has been criticism that you know an oil and gas producing uh, state is hosting the COP, and 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 is that the right thing? I mean, I think they will be. I think there will be uh, uh, a lot of people watching the, the performance of the COP presidency going into this to, to see if they can deliver a really strong outcome. I mean, my, and, and I think, so I'm trying to keep, I'm keeping an open mind about that. Um, I'm aware that they've been certainly trying to hire in really good people who help them with that. Um, they've, been, they've been recruiting actively among people who really know the UN world very, very well. Um, and so I, I take that as a positive. Um, and I guess we'll see. I mean, the proof will be in the in the pudding. But I think that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll certainly, you know, people are aware of this and there will be pressure for a really, a really strong COP. Um, and I think we should judge. I think we should judge this COP in the same way that we would judge, judge others and hold it up to the same standards. The, the, a few things. One is uh, they're not the presidency of the COP yet. I mean, the, the COP, the, it is actually the Egyptian presidency that take us, takes us up to the and COP28. And then it's turned over, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's turned over. So uh, the Egyptian presidency is continuing to work uh, and work with the, the incoming presidency to make sure that, that things are happening now, such as a transitional committee for loss and damage, uh, working with the UNFCCC. So they only take over at the COP. So a lot of the work, particularly the, the as uh, both of you know, but the, the people listening perhaps don't, we have a preparatory meeting of two weeks in Bonn in June, uh, probably three weeks because they actually come the week before to do preparation in their group meetings. So you're looking at the, a lot of the work for COP28 will happen under the Egyptian presidency. That's the number one. Secondly, um, the uh, United Arab Emirates is more of a gas producer than an oil and gas producer. Mm -hmm. And and thirdly, um, the president um, of the COP has been one of the main pushers for renewable energy, mm -hmm. both in the United Arab Emirates and in the sense of their support outside. And also the United Arab Emirates hosts, I think, only one international organization, and that is the International Renewable Energies Agency. Yeah. And so they've been, I think, working with um, uh, them to make sure that some of these issues are addressed. So I would, I would add that in. They have Rosanna as the champion um, of the COP. Rosanna is former head of their Environment Protection Agency. She's at the moment the president of IUCN. Uh, she was, before she worked for the government, the head of WWF in the United Arab Emirates. She's brilliant. She, she will definitely do a lot on the, the champion side to engineer as many initiatives as you can. And perhaps this is a Richard Nixon China issue which is perhaps you need the United Arab Emirates, an oil producer, to address the fossil fuel because they are uh, in that group. And they are, as you, we all know, most of the uh, big producers are looking to do 
as much as they can to move beyond oil and gas themselves because they're investing in lots of renewables. The big, I can't remember the figure, but the big Saudi investment in Egypt for COP27 was on, if I remember, uh, hydrogen uh, to be produced in Egypt. And so they are looking to kind of use whatever money they've got to invest in renewables, which is what Norway did. Norway has the biggest um, sovereign wealth fund uh, where they invested their money for the good of the community. Um, of course, we see Norway as a positive, but they still have an oil and gas industry there. I, I really appreciate that. And there's no doubt in my listeners or my mind that you, you are both well steeped in, in, in the current goings on and also the controversy of, uh, that we would see, but also that made you very apt, both of you, um, at being the editors on this cumulative great work, Heroes of Environmental Diplomacy, because it didn't start out that way. It started out as politicians, diplomats coming in, representing, negotiating, doing doing things. Um, and they were normal people like you and I that did amazing things in a complex uh, system or structure to, to do that. And, and the one, uh, and this is for Chris, it's really his chapter, not chapter three on Mustafa uh, Tolba, but I'm sure you can speak about that too, Felix. But the, you know, the Egyptian king, the Montreal Protocol, the things that occurred there and how uh, it, it, it emerged for the, our ozone problem that we had and some things that developed out of that. Um, uh, may, maybe specifically about this chapter, but also some maybe aha moments as you were going through doing your editing on your specific her heroes and chapters, Chris, uh, that you're like, there's a reoccurring theme. There's something that's happening here. There's some certain traits that are emerging. I would love it if you can address those for me and kind of speak to that. That's a that's a why good. I want to know why Felix is laughing though. <laughs> well, I'll, do you want to answer that or uh, do you want? Or... I, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, I, I can I can have a guess, but we'll come we'll come to we'll come to that, but. But I'm glad you asked about Mustafa Tolba because he really was the inspiration um, behind, in many ways, behind the, 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 this book and, and, and how it came to be. Um, which, just to give you a little, a little background, um, it was about four years ago, and I was kind of, you know, reflecting on the state of the world, feeling a little bit down, and I started to think about, well, how can how can I get more optimistic about things? What's an antidote to this kind of pessimism about the state of the environment and the state of the world. And I thought about the world that I'd been involved with and Felix has been involved with for many years now, this world of international diplomacy, and began to think, you know, we've had, all right, things look bad, but we've actually had some victories. We've had some successes. And um, if we start to tell some of those stories, we could perhaps inspire, you know, future leaders the next generation of folks um, who can lead us to new successes, even bigger successes. And the first one, I asked, and so the first example I thought of was Mustafa Tolba. And he was quite a character. Um, he was uh, from, from Egypt. He was, um, became the head of, uh, firstly, the deputy head of, of UNEP, the UN Environment Programme, which was pretty new back in the 70s, and then became the executive director of the UN Environment Programme. I think it was 1973, 74. So it was quite, it was quite young. And he was, and at that point, um, it was, it was just becoming this, this idea that the ozone layer was under threat from, from CFCs was just entering science. It was pretty new science, but he was a scientist and he looked at the work. Uh, he looked at the, the, the research and realized that we were facing a, 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 an existential threat. Um, that could have a massive impact on humanity if we didn't address it. And he was implacable. He was a character, which is why I think what Felix was laughing about, because, well, one, I would say, firstly, I'd say one of the things that all of these leaders share in the book is persistence. 
Yeah. Right? Commitment and persistence over many years to get things done. But their persistence took different shapes and forms. And I would say that in Mustafa Tolba's case, his persistence was, he was an indomitable character. He, he wasn't, I mean, everything I've been told, I, I met him, I met him a couple of times, but kind of later on in his career when he was semi-retired. And But even then you could see that he was a very strong personality and would not take no for an answer. And he, you know, what he achieved uh, with the Montreal Protocol was by no means, I mean, it wasn't just that it wasn't a guaranteed success. It looked highly unlikely when he began working on this. And yet within a handful of years, he had, he had um, led a coalition of unlikely partners, you know, ranging, ranging from, you know, you're, you're the environmentalists and activists you'd expect all the way through to Margaret Thatcher and Ronald, and Ronald Reagan. And yeah. so he got this incredible coalition of the left and the right of all political stripes. And, you know, we can... You know, we can thank him for that because without that, the ozone layer would have depleted and already we would have, just, just to name, you know, we would have a lot more, um, ul uh, you know, ultraviolet radiation entering, you know, striking Earth. And already we would have tens of millions more cases of skin cancer, un unknown damage to, you know, ecosystems, to agriculture, you know. And so, you know, this, this, this individual who was implacable and just, you know, incredibly strong personality, built this incredible coalition and made something something really great happen. Yeah, I, I think you lucked out. You have some some pretty good heroes that you uh, focused in on in the book, and and who were met. They're all amazing, and there's all wonderful things. Uh, and I I just don't don't think a lot of people when they hear Montreal Protocol that they understand what was really behind that and who and what kind of really battle uh, it was to, to kind of get to, to get to where we were to save uh, and, and fix the problem in, in many respects. And it took a personality like that. And you so eloquently in the writing tell the story and the description that, that makes you feel that personality, even though I've never met him, uh, I've, I've seen some things about him before, but but it's absolutely true. Um, I'm going to come back to you with with another question in a moment, uh, Chris. But it's Felix's turn mm -hmm. for really the father of sustainable development, Maurice Strong, and um, he, Felix knows how how big a fan and and uh, I am an advocate of the SDGs and sustainable development period and um, the history and as well as this last book. But the same question to you, Felix, um, for the chapters you added for putting this book uh, together, for going through and kind of working through this process, what were the aha moments? And I know you proved Maurice wasn't on your radar before this book that there's been many times and things um, as well in your bio that, that sir, can you kind of give us some insights and, you know, lighten us uh, why this is and what you've learned throughout this process specifically towards Maurice? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just kind of want to reiterate that, yeah, this is, this vision was Chris's and he, he when he okay. rang me up and said, Oh, let, let's do this book. I told him to get lost because I was finishing <laughs> another book at the time and I hadn't got any, any um, time to do it. And then I thought about it and it's just such a delicious idea that he came up with. I couldn't not work with him on it. And so he deserves a lot of the credit for putting the theory together. And then for, we both worked on trying to find people because initially we were going to write all the chapters and then we realized that wasn't going to happen. And so we were very lucky to find people. Uh, I won't say uh, who was the last one, but um, but I have to say that I was starting to buy little voodoo dolls and pins because he was late in getting the chapter in. But, you know, he knows who he is when he, li when he listens to this. <laughs> um, I mean, the thing with Morris is that you could have chosen anything. I mean, his footprint on sustainable development is huge. And, you know, you talk about one of the stories we could have told was Stockholm, where it was the first time that China... Uh, actually attended a UN meeting because it had just joined the UN. And they uh, one of the issues in any 
intergovernmental negotiation is when a country moves beyond its red lines that it's agreed before it's come to the conference, it has to go back to capital to get an agreement. And they were at the final negotiations and there wasn't time to go back to Beijing for the Chinese to, uh, to have a decision on whether to endorse the outcome document. And he persuaded them to just move from the seats where they sat to speak to the seats behind so that they could be viewed as they hadn't walked out. They'd actually been in the room, but they hadn't actually endorsed it. And that was a way of moving it forward. And we were actually for a different book for Only One Earth. We had a copy of the Chinese input to the Stockholm conference, which was the first time China had imported to a UN event. But the, the one surprise for me on the Morris thing was I, I just had assumed that um, the, the story that we were going to tell, which was about the opening up of the UN to these nine stakeholder groups, um, that it was a, you know, a, a clear process through the different uh, negotiations uh, from the first preparatory meeting um, to the fourth. But it was really a, a slip of the hand or whatever you call it by Morris. Most people didn't know what he was doing. His deputy didn't know what he was doing. Um, the people who were in charge of giving accreditation and helping stakeholders didn't know what he was doing. And he was slowly, re because of what had happened in Stockholm, where governments hadn't fully implemented what had been agreed, he had come to the conclusion over 20 years that we needed the other implementers, whether that's local government or industry um, or women's groups or NGOs, we needed them at the table as well. And that um, we needed to also have those which were vulnerable groups, whether it was youth or indigenous peoples, um, also at the table. And he slowly built a narrative outside the um, process. And then, so in UN processes, New York is the most political. The first three PrepComs were not in New York. They were in Nairobi and Geneva. And they didn't really, I think, realize what he was doing. And then when it arrived to New York, the, the New York missions were like, "What? what is this? And he was able to keep it in. Him and Tommy Coe were able to keep it in. Tommy Coe was the chair of the conference. Um, and the, they fought for each of them. And once the delegates started to engage in New York, then you've pretty much won the argument because then they're just negotiating or bracketing text. And of the nine groups, the last one to be accepted, which was in um, uh, in, in itself, were the, uh, the science community because um, the... Um, the Vatican was very worried about things being based on science. So the story is fascinating. A few people knew what he was doing and he was where there wasn't a stakeholder global group. He nudged people to set it up. So you had the Business Council on Sustainable Development set up because the International Chamber of Commerce was too right wing. And so he set up a progressive CEO group. For the local government, there was no local government global bro process that existed. So he, he worked with Jeb Brugman to set up the International Council for Local Environmental Issues. There wasn't really a women's process. He worked with WeDo to have the Women's International Conference in Miami, I think, uh, before Rio. So, you know, where there were gaps in these things, he tried to establish or begin to establish um, organs that would take it forward. And one of the big outcomes, it may not have seemed big at the time, and I can say with some sure that I didn't think it was, but chapter 28 that deals with local uh, authorities mm -hmm. has a, a you know, sentence that calls for local authorities to work with their local communities to create local Agenda 21s. Within 10 years, there were 6,000 local Agenda 21s because local government started to take up the challenge that they'd been asked. So an amazing achievement. And Morris was a different type than um, Mustafa. Uh, he was kind of like looking to nudge people in the right direction and where there were gaps. He, he, he recognized gaps before anyone else recognized gaps and tried to deal with 
filling those gaps, uh, using his amazing charisma to, uh, to inspire people. You know, the conference had, a, I can't remember, was it 108 or something heads of state? And it was the biggest number of heads of state that we had at a UN event. He called it the Earth Summit. That wasn't what the name of the conference was. It was the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. But by calling it an Earth Summit, he inspired uh, uh, people to go along. Mm -hmm. It is in the book, in the stories, in um, the list, there's uh, a lot of ties to Brazil, a lot of people from Brazil. Um, even though the book's diverse and everything, it's, it's really a lot happens in Rio uh, throughout everything. COP25 was actually supposed to be in Brazil and uh, in Rio. And then it was last minute canceled. It was moved to to uh, Chile. Chile had uh, unrest, and then they moved it to Madrid. Um, it, it, it's funny over the years, and you've seen the story much longer than I have. You've done the research in history how the changes, the turmoils in our in our world. COP twenty six in Glasgow, Chris. Uh, uh, you're in Dublin now, correct? If I understand, you're in Dublin now. And, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I felt it was one of the most corporate climate conferences I'd ever seen. So many corporate sponsorships, a big, huge attendance, plus the mask wearing, the daily testing, and all sorts of things going on there. Um, it is a unique environment to be in where there's really, as, as Felix said, you know, a handful, a small thousand, a couple thousand as well, who are actually in doing the negotiations. Um, you did a chapter on probably one of my biggest uh, heroes, in my opinion, uh, that I look up to, and I don't know if I'm going to get a uh, ostracized because I'm saying this, and it's Barack Obama, uh, you know, the missing hero, the Copenhagen Climate Summit. And um, it, it, would, it would be nice to kind of see how, you know, that, that uh, it, tell us a little bit about why the missing hero, why, why it uh, turned, turned out that way. And if th there was, some ticklings or advice for our, the U.S. current president, Biden, which just made a, a snafu on, on a new oil project anyway. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. So that was a really fun and interesting chapter to write because when I first proposed that chapter, I'm not, I think Felix was, maybe think tell me if i'm wrong but I, I got the impression that you were maybe and maybe and when i talked to other people about it they were certainly i got some feedback like why are you do isn't this about <laughs> environmental successes like what <laughs> the copenhagen summit so a little bit of background for your listeners so this was this was the, a summit in 2009 it was 12 years after the kyoto protocol was signed which was a successful you know first step in combating climate change and the expectation at Copenhagen was that it would take us on in leaps and bounds from Kyoto and really move us forward. And, you know, uh, it did not do that. It didn't achieve that. And, you know, I was I was one of those folks unlucky enough to be there. <laughs> and, you know, at the time it was, a you know, a lot of folks left pretty depressed and, and, and quite sad. And, and, and you know, Obama got some blame for for what was seen, widely seen at the time, as an unmitigated failure. Um, but I think as time's gone by, and as we look at it, you know, with the, with with uh, a little more hindsight and a little more a little more time having passed, people are beginning to reappraise what Copenhagen achieved. And I think the conclusion I reached, having interviewed a lot of people who attended that and looked at uh, and looked at it afresh, was that yes, Copenhagen was, you know. It was. It did feel like a train wreck. A lot of things went badly wrong, but some of the ideas that came out of Copenhagen ultimately led to a, a pretty strong outcome in Paris six years later, and that you know Obama played a pretty key role in that. And I think you know the the story. I mean, 
for folks who read this book, I'm going to think it's, there's some just hilarious stuff in this where a, a sitting president of the United States shows up at a meeting that is about to fail and tries to sit down with some other world leaders only to re discover that they've actually, they're kind of hiding from him and they don't want to, they don't want to meet with him at that point. And there's this kind of hide and seek involving Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton seeking out other world leaders to actually get them to sit down and try and come to some sort of conclusion because some of these other world leaders for quite legitimate reasons were just not ready to cut a deal yet. But Obama found them and made the best deal that he felt he could at that time. Now, some people think he could have done a lot better. Um, I, I would leave it to, to, I would say, read the chapter and make your own, draw your own conclusions. And so that's why it was kind of a, a really fun chapter to write because you know, you could read that chapter and say, yeah, Obama was a real villain here. Or you could read it and say, he was kind of a hero and he was a, he did some stuff and sowed the seeds of this very threadbare agreement that came out. But if you read the fine print, this led to a much greater success a few years later. And maybe that's all he could have done um, in Copenhagen, given the geopolitics, given what the, what the situation was at the time. So yeah, it was it was it was really fun. I personally, I'm leaning towards being quite impressed because just this idea that that a president would would race around the corridors seeking out these other folks and just not take no for an answer that's pretty that's pretty rare and highly unusual. I would say. How many presidents play hide and seek at diplo in a yeah. diplomatic conference? Right. So it's a very interesting story. Hey, you've got to have fun hey, with this. That's for sure. So just to add to that, I mean, it's a, cla it's a you want to contrast that, which is 24-hour period that uh, Chris is talking about, with Sidney Holt, who spent his life saving the whales. And, but without him, we wouldn't have the whales. But yeah. just got adding to the Chris's story, because I also was in Copenhagen, there's a very good uh, article if people want to uh, – uh, to Google Richard Black, BBC, Copenhagen failure, and he does 10 points on why it failed. Yeah. But one of the reasons why it, because the Copenhagen Accord is basically the Paris Agreement. Uh, it's about the 100 billion, which Hillary put on the table. It's about everybody uh, making their natural determined contributions, uh, which at the time, developing countries didn't want. They wanted a, a Kyoto too. Uh, so that he got India, China, uh, South Africa and Brazil in, I think, the room and persuaded them. The problem was, or one of the problems, there were many, uh, the Danish presidency was an example of one of the problems. They didn't know how to do the presidency well. They, uh, the problem was that he didn't bring in the chair of G77. And so the chair of G77 in uh, 2009 was Sudan. And of course, Sudan was on the evil, uh, the list of um, the agents of evil. And that was why he didn't, why the Americans didn't invite him in. But the problem that they had was that in three, con in three places in the world, Sudan had two uh, ambassadors, one for the North and one for the South. That was in New York, in Washington and in Brussels. And the ambassador, uh, that was chairing G77 was from the Christian South, not the Muslim North. So a, a wonderful guy called Ambassador Lumumba, who had actually previously worked for McKinsey. So a kind of capitalist in his own right. Um, and they didn't invite him. And then there was a repercussions, which I think Chris may have heard of from people like Ian Fry, who were the Tuvalu uh, uh, things that they felt they were excluded because the chair of G77 had been excluded from that agreement. And so instead of the agreement being welcomed, the agreement was noted. And so that meant that it was, it took six years to get back to some of those things. Not that those six years were not good years for setting up the Green Climate Fund or whatever was uh, done in, uh, in uh, Durban and things like that. Those were important things. But the miscalculation of not having the G77 chair in there because they thought it was the Muslim North is something that, you know, some people should get some blame for within the American administration. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a, re a really great point that, you know, I think one of the criticisms of, of Copenhagen was that it didn't include it, that a lot of people felt excluded from the discussions. And so because that wasn't a success, there was a really great lesson learned after that, that subsequent COPs, 
were really much more open and transparent. And I think the lesson was learned that you couldn't get a really strong deal in a small room, that you really had to bring it to a wider group. And uh, yeah, it's a great point, Felix. But, but also, I think that the contrast uh, uh, was recognized in the choosing of Christina Figueroa as the head of the UNFCCC, who, if you read the chapter that uh, Chris has done on, uh, that Andrew has done on her, you'll find that yeah. the way that she operated, not only with the countries, but with the staff, was a way of inclusivity and the way of building bridges. And that, I think, with a French presidency, which one wouldn't have expected the way that they did it also. You would have expected from France more of a, ge of a grand gesture approach. But they also had learned from Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And so the, having a presidency that was on top of what was needed, having a secretariat led by uh, such a wonderful a uh, person who was so open and inclusive, I think it, it laid the foundation for uh, for what became the agreement in Paris. Yeah, just and just to add to that, you know, the the, the appointment. I think that that so the the chapter on Copenhagen is followed by a chapter on the Paris Agreement, and the hero of the Paris Agreement in our book is Christiana Figueres, who um, became who headed up the UN's climate change office was appointed not long after Copenhagen. And as Felix says, I think, I think the lesson learned from Copenhagen was that inclusivity, and she was just great at that. Yeah. Really, really good. And so that, that chapter on Paris and how we got a strong outcome is a chapter in part about her emotional intelligence, her diplomatic uh, skills, and, and her approach to, to winning people over and building this incredible coalition so that by the time Paris came around, it wasn't an inevitability, but it felt like one because of what she'd done over the preceding years. So, yeah, it's a great, great I'm glad you, you mentioned uh, Christiana uh, Felix because she, she's, she's another example of, of, of a fantastic um, hero. And I just, all the chapters I just... are absolutely fabulous. They're all one after the other. So, But the other fascinating thing is the last uh, three, I think, um, are all women from developing countries. Maria mm -hmm. Velotti, Paolo Cabrera on the SDGs, uh, and Christina Figueroa. So the shift from white northern men, uh, which is the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. to developing country women is interesting as well. Yeah, and that's, and that's part of the reason is that the stories are roughly chronological. So, you know, some of the, the first stories, you know, chapter one, which is about the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, that story is, is mostly about what occurred in the 1960s. And then we have Sidney Holt or his story on the International Whaling Commission and what he did. It spans 60 years, but it begins in the 1950s. But by, by the, the later stories, it is interesting that there is more developing country folks, more women leaders coming through. I mean, it'll be, it'll be interesting if we do a second edition of this in five or 10 years, um, who, who will be featured in that? And I have a suspicion it will be uh, even more. Kind of diverse. I hope to see it because I see that you, you guys' finger is on the pulse. You can see you're there to see it evolve and see those those heroes emerge who are in there. Uh, Christina, I, I always thought her last name was Figueres, Christiana Figueres. I, I, she has a super podcast, Outrageous Optimism. It is a fabulous podcast. And um, we also, just to go back to that chapter, um, because it's really the journey that you take us on in the chapters in the book is fabulous. And, and it really leads up to what we're experiencing. But it also, at that time, at the, the COP21 uh, in Paris, we had the terrorist attacks. Uh, Al Gore's twenty-five or yeah, twenty-five hours of climate reality or twenty-four yeah. hours of climate reality TV. Yeah. I was there, and that was stopped during the middle of the broadcast. There was all sorts of controversy. Are we going to keep going? And um, that, on top of her wonderful uh, spirit and optimism, and bringing people together, and all the things you described. Uh, uh, is the true measures of hero, and today she's 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 still in that respect, and I believe many many of those in the book are still also 
uh, in that same leaders and probably can go on just like uh, Ban Ki-moon and others to to be part of groups like the elders, to be part of groups that are continuing in, in a private way or a different way to still contribute to move humanity on the right side of history. Um, I have some some final questions as we we wrap up our podcast um, that that I really want to ask you, and they're not typical, but they are tied to the book, and they're also tied to your experiences, your knowledge in, in writing overall. Um, in the conclusion, you bring up some of these things as well. Um, why do we have these issues? Do, do you mean why do we have to have intergovernmental meetings to agree things? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, because, um, yeah, the UN predominantly deals with, uh, or at least the environmental agreements deal with transboundary issues. And so where something is having an impact and other countries, you need to find a way of regulating it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just say that one of the things we didn't mention is that the, the arc of each of the chapters is also interesting. We look at who these people were. What's their story? Where did they come from? What, what, what inspired them? Then what was the issue that they addressed? And then what happened to them and the issue afterwards? Mm. And I think that's an interesting arc because, you know, they are people and they've had certain things in their lives that have pushed them in those directions. And we wanted to share that just because we're all heroes. There's so many people out there who are, you know, trying to make uh, uh, an impact and they all contribute and they all have their in individual stories. And we wanted to show that these were individuals as much as negotiators as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could I, oh, yeah, you I mean, have I, something I just, more to say, Chris? Yeah, just, just, you know, that question about your question about why, why are we doing this? I think is such, is such a good one because, it's good to, you know, it's good to stop sometimes and think, OK, why are we doing this? And, 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 you know, Felix is, is, I just wanted to emphasize Felix's response, which is that some of these, you know, in a globalized world, some of these problems are just too big. They're too big for individual countries, for individual, you know, companies, for individual billionaires, for anyone else to fix. And, you know, climate change is a classic example of that. But you can look across all of the issues that we deal with, you know, um, you know the ozone issue is, is, is another great example. Um, you know, the, the sustainable development, these are, these are just global issues and we need to work together to solve them. And that's one of the key messages, I think, of, of, of this book is that, you know, I, I know that there's, there's, there's been a lot of criticism of multilateralism. There's been criticism of the UN. There's been criticism of diplomacy. But... It's the only game in town if we're going to solve these these problems. And I personally believe strongly in multilateralism and that ne- governments and nation states need to invest in that to get to the outcomes we need because we cannot fix these problems by ourselves. And yes, the criticism that diplomacy is messy and complex and difficult and frustrating and at times too slow, these are all true. But they it does ultimately provide the answer and i would say diplomacy is like democracy it's messy but it's the best you know it's the best possible option for for us and 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 ultimately it works and and that's what this book is about it's about showing really shining examples of when diplomacy does work and does deliver um and so that's you know that's uh that's why i was excited to kind of work on this book but the other thing to think about is that uh, in 2023, we got a global convention agreement on oceans beyond national yeah. boundaries. And in 24, we'll get a global convention on eliminating plastics in some form. So in two years, within 23 and 24, we'll have two massive successes in multilateral negotiations. They may not have gone as far as we wanted, but, you know, to some extent, the issue of how you design these global agreements actually goes back to Mustafa Tolba, where we we started. Due to the how long the law of the sea process took, Mustafa came up with the idea of a framework convention. So you, the framework convention is where you agree the narrative. 
is the protocols afterwards where you start to dig into targets and whatever. So you can get most people to sign up to the narrative and then it becomes mm. more important then to, to dig down and see what targets you can get. Mm. I have two questions for each of you that you must answer. The, the, the next one is the hardest one that I will give you. Um, and I'm, I want to start with, with Chris first on this. What does a world that works for everyone look like to you, Chris? Gosh. Well, you know, as I said, I, I'm a big fan of multilateralism and I'm a big fan of cooperation. And I think, um, and I think that that is, that's what we need to create a world that feels um, fair and equitable for, for everyone. And, you know, I, and I think, you know, that's, that is, that is, is the way forward, and I, and and I believe that most uh, nations and governments and people recognise that. Felix, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I think uh, Chris and I are on the same page. But what I would also say, because it's about a fair and equitable world, I, I think that one of the things that has a huge impact on being able to you know, in a sense, uh, share better is the cost of energy. And if you were to move, if we are moving to a situation where we're using renewables, the chances and the opportunities for bringing people out of poverty, giving them a better life, I think is quite important. On the other side of the negative bit is we're going to have a water crisis and how we deal with that water crisis will be really important. Um, we're looking at a 30 to 40 percent uh, shortfall in water globally by uh, 2030 in the estimates by the Stockholm Environment Institute. And we need to think just like we've done for energy about how we conserve water, how we uh, make sure that everyone has access. Otherwise, we're going to have serious problems uh, in the future with people uh, having to be forced to move because climate change has also had an impact on what type of weather patterns they have, uh, uh, which is different than the ones they had in the past. S sustainable development is um, on our radar. It's been on our radar for a long time, so, uh, 50 years now. Uh, 72 is really the beginning and even probably longer. Uh, from your book, negotiating the sustainable development goals, and we're we're really hoping till 2030 to achieve this. There's um, something that's been bubbling up in the last two years uh, very rapidly, and not not many are aware of it. And I want to I want to kind of throw it out in, into the room. So we're we're coming up with more and more models uh, for the future, more and more goals, more and more solutions. We have the SDGs, then we have ESG, we have a CSRD coming, we have science-based targets, and we have the negotiations going on. But in the last two years, we've been seeing the emergence of numerous new economic models. And um, what is it, SDG 7 or 8 talks about economic growth and and uh, the SDGs are a new, entirely new economic model. It's 90 to 94 trillion U.S. dollars to reach them by December 2030. But they're not the only ones, and a lot of people don't know that, that, that they are an economic model, just like circular economy, uh, donut economics, mission economics, shared economics, platform economics, on and on. There's more than 32 emerging ecological economic models out there. The closest one that's, that's functionable, that has the research and that is, I would say, is the sustainable development goals. And just in the last two years, there's been more than 20 books. The Club of Rome released a book on a new economic model with Kate Rowers and written on new ecological models. The world is somehow, or there's a lot of movement or this discussion, what are the new models? What are the new economic models that, that moving are moving forward? 
Um, with that kind of that setup around this, and, and uh, I want I want to ask you. It's not similar to the question I just asked you. What does the world that works for everyone look like? What are what are the models like planetary boundaries, circular economy, donut economics, the sustainable development goals as a new economic model that you find are the most hopeful and that will also emerge? Like Felix just said, there's some new things coming on plastic for models that will really take us into the future, into 2050. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Kate's work and the planetary boundaries is part of the donut. So you've kind of got that already. Uh, so I think that she's trying that out with um, different uh, local governments and with industry. Uh, we'll have to see where that goes. The circular economy is clearly underpinning for the first time a UN convention. The Plastics Convention has it as a way of approaching this. So we're seeing different models but which often are reflected in uh, each other and so I think the planetary boundaries stroke the donut the economics and the circular economy are all part of that same ecosystem so I think that's important the UN uh, for the summit of the futures is looking at replacing GDP it's one of the things that's on their agenda you have with the French Barbados conference in June are looking at reform of the Bretton Woods institutions uh, you're looking at the Summit of the Future, looking at reform of the same thing, and also discussions on uh, reform of the Security Council and other aspects. So we have a lot of the architecture being discussed to see if it's going to be reformed. I think the problem we have is where Russia and China are at the moment, and that makes that a fluid discussion until that in a sense, becomes much more clear uh, on whether that's going, they're going to contribute in a positive way or in a way that is less positive. But I think that the economic discussions are in flux, and that I think is really important if we are going to realign it. Uh, the other thing I would say is the outcome from the Glasgow Climate Conference where the Glasgow um, Finance Initiative was set up. If we really want to change things, we need the capital market to be supporting things that we want, like the SDGs, and not things like the oil or gas companies. So I think changing the landscape of the, of the capital market would have a huge change, mm -hmm. number one. And then I think the other discussion that's going on is how do we integrate the SDG and climate into the um, – the, uh, into the um, credit rating agencies uh, so that that then also forces local authorities and governments to take in resilience and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, two things I actually wanted to add to what you said, Felix, is so there's the well-being economy or the well-being index. There's the gross national happiness index. So I also see this movement away from GDP to some other models. There's, I mean, the Girls National Happiness is instigated from the Center for Girls National Happiness in Bhutan. That's been out for quite some time um, and, and things. So it's interesting to see some of those and that you're also uh, discuss that. Um, in some respects, I'm very much a futurist. So I'm always thinking, okay, what are the models that can kind of shift and change or what are we seeing? Chris, please go ahead. Yeah, look, I, Mark, I'm really glad you mentioned that, that whole question of well-being because I, I think that that gets to the heart of what we're trying, trying to achieve here. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you asked about economic models. I think one that has been firmly discredited in the last few years is neoliberalism. And I think we've, you know, I think this, this, this idea that the invisible hand of, of markets can fix everything um, is, 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 has been proven to not not be true, and you know although I, I, you know, I personally am a strong advocate for capitalism, but I think you know excluding government from playing a role is is, is foolish. And I think whenever we've had a, a crisis, you look at the financial crisis of two thousand eight to nine, you look at the financial crisis caused by lockdowns and the pandemic, and the response has always involved government intervention and governments. For the most part, I think making making some good decisions about how to support people and ensure that people uh, can get through this crisis. 
Um, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of the circular economy. I think it, there's, it's a really great idea and should be pursued more. You know, I th even think you know ideas like like the Human Development Index, the Sustainable Development Index, um, Gross Happiness, you know, index. These are ideas that move us beyond this traditional reliance on this one metric GDP, which I think has led us down a really bad tunnel because you know. GDP is one measure of a, of, a, of a country's wealth. It's not even that accurate. And it doesn't show how well the wealth is being distributed. And so, you know, there's this, uh, there's this economic term, a Gini coefficient, which shows inequality. And, you know, some of the world's richest countries, like the US, like the UK, they're very wealthy, but they're also highly unequal. And I think that that is, you know, I think that those, those countries um, can can do better. I mean, these countries have the ability and the, and the heft to to help, you know, long term solve poverty uh, and to do it in a sustainable way. And so I think these new ideas that are emerging are just brilliant. And I'm, I'm glad that this conversation is happening. And, and I would just say, I mean, it was Bobby Kennedy in 68 who reminded people that GDP recognizes how many car accidents we have and how many bombs we've used that it doesn't recognize um, the happiness that we have or the, the strength of our families. And it was he who said, I think, um, uh, some people ask thing, uh, ask, uh, why, why other people, um, ask why not. And so I think mm -hmm. we need to dream of things that have yet to happen and make sure that they're part of the agenda. I just uh, did a five day workshop at the World Government Summit in Dubai a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, it was on the future of governance. Uh, 120 governments were, were taking part. Um, there was discussions at the same summit about agile government, uh, uh, about uh, participatory governance. Um, many topics. So it's not just these economic models that are that are emerging every day. It's not just the books that are being written. There's this overarching dis-ease of, of people and humanity that says the systems are not working. They're mm -hmm. not working for, especially in times of climate cal calamity and, and times of war and times of uh, refugees or displacement, that these systems are pandemics they tend not to work for all of us anymore. We see this microscope on the problems even clearer. And so um, I, I really appreciate you bringing these. And I, I'm kind of expecting to see an, a, another extended version and, and maybe that there'll be more some, some discussions on the future of governance, the future of diplomacy, some of those new leaders that are like Kate Rilworth, like uh, Johan Rockström, Professor Johan Rockström, like these others who are thinking of these new models, how can we make the systems better? How can we evolve and be future fit to for for our emerging planet? And, and, and I believe you guys have the pulse because you know the big picture, but so I would really I would, like I, to say I that. Would just, Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, not everybody is interested in these new forms of governance and you find on the left, uh, the more far left part of the NGO world that they do not want it to be anything other than governments uh, because at that point it becomes much more difficult from their perspective to, I think, uh, support the poorer in society. They feel government is the legitimate way of doing it. So uh, there is a uh, definitely a, a clash of ideologies going on between um, a more liberal democracy approach, which is trying to test new forms of governance, and the more far left views that it should just be governments that should be doing it. Chris, do you have something to say? It looked like you're... No, I mean, I think uh, Felix makes a great point. I mean, I, I, I think I think that... Um, we have the opportunity, we have the resources um, to transform our world in a positive way. We already see some of it happening. You know, you look back at how, you know, when I started in this world, in this in this uh, area, uh, wind power and solar were obscenely expensive, and now they're the cheapest forms of energy available. So you see how that how rapid these transformations can can occur. And so I'm, you know, I'm optimistic. Um, yeah. I think that we. We just need to learn learn the right lessons. We need to try to 
avoid this kind of the, some of the some of the culture wars and recognize that we're all in this planet together and uh, and uh, hopefully have a have a have a good discussion about that and come to some sort of middle find some middle ground because that's where I think that's where I think we can really make progress. Felix and Chris, thank you both for gotcha. letting us insight of your ideas. Highly recommend this book. Everyone who's listening, go out and get it. Uh, we have only teased some of the stories. There's so much more that you can get into depth and substance. And I thank uh, Rutledge, Erskine, and Taylor and Francis for uh, providing us with the books and, and having you guys come on. Thank you so much. And that's all I have for you, unless you wanted to ask me any questions before I tell you goodbye. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Yeah. You're more than welcome. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I hope we'll talk to you at the next book. <laughs> it's a Look dream. forward to it. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.